And so I, I thought I, I would share with you um, a practice that I have in my own life. It's, a, it's a, a practice I've done now for over 20 years. The last week of the year, I set it aside just for time of reflection, prayer, and, and, and reevaluating my year. And then I take my calendar and I literally go over my calendar, uh, not only day by day, but hour by hour. Uh, every, every day I go every hour and, and this is the person I met there and this is what I was doing here. And as I, as I go through the calendar, I just keep my legal pad beside me and I, I write down things like, wow, that, that, was, a, that, was, a, that was a good day. Uh, oh, this was a, this, I didn't do well here. I, this was, I, I, I would like to have a do-over here. Do, do you ever have times when you want to have a do-over? And, I, and I, I just, I put things in different categories. Uh, uh, times where I really sensed that, that, that there was a, a real blessing of God on my life. The times when, when I felt that I was living too much for myself. And I mean, I go through a very, th- it takes me, it really takes me the week. I just evaluate it. I, one of the things I do is I take every special thing that Margaret and I did during that year. And I put it together. And then one night during that week, I, I pull her aside for dinner. And I, I sit down with my list and I go through everything we did all year that was very special. And, and it's just, it's a time for me to reflect. It's a time for me to to evaluate, to look at my year. And it's from that that I form my next year as far as I put down, okay, this year, uh, here are lessons I learned from last year. I don't, I, some of them I don't want to repeat. Some of them I certainly want to do more. Here's people I should spend more time with. This is something I should be thinking more on. And I, I lay out my entire year based upon the reflection of, of last year. And I ask God during this time for one word that would help me in the new year. Just one word. You say, why one word? It's because I'm not smart enough to handle a sentence. (laughs) And a paragraph would be just off the charts for me. So I ask him for one word, and and, uh, that's something I just every day think upon and pray about, and and, and usually toward the end of the week, it it begins to form. And And the word that came to my heart this year that I think God wants me to focus on in 2015 is the word intentional. He, he wants me to be intentional. He wants me to, maybe more than ever before in my life, really focus on some things that are important and, 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 and live a life every day, not a, a, a day that kind of where I try to accept my day, but a, but a day where I lead my day, where a day where I, I focus on making sure that I really really put my intentionality where it needs to be. We, we, we all heard the expression, all is well that ends well. I, I'm here to tell you all is well that begins well. And this is the first of the year. And for many of you, this is, this is your chance. This is your shot. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity. All of you that are watching online, the different campuses, Daystar, this is your opportunity. This is your time. This is your moment. This is your place. For you to really begin to live an intentional life. And then I ask usually for a scripture that goes with it. And, and, and so let's kind of dive in on, on, on the screen. You'll see that the section I'm going to deal with, Matthew chapter 6, is all about focus and faith. In other words, trust God and see things correctly. Be intentional. Okay. Let's go with the passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 6. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which have never been seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way that he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what you may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Intentional living means two things. In this scripture, intentional living means, first of all, knowing God and how he works. Jesus was very clear to say to us that if we want to live an intentional life, 
We have to know God and we have to know how he works in our lives. I love the passage in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Don't let the wise brag on the wisdom. Don't let the heroes brag on their exploits. Don't let the rich brag on their riches. If you brag, brag of this and this only, that you understand and know me. In other words, he, he, he said, if you're, going to, if you're going to get excited about something, if you're going to brag about something, don't brag about what you got, what you did, where you've been, who you know. Just brag on the fact you know him. In fact, I'll tell you what's fantastic. It's not the fact that I know him. It's the fact that he knows me. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, that God, the creator, God, Omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, he knows me, and he knows you. And, and, and Jesus said, if you want to live an intentional life, you've got to, you've got to know God, and you've got to know the works of God, and, and, and you, you've, got to, you've got to live in his life, and, and you've got to have him fully, you've got to be submerged in who he is and what he's wanting to do in your life. So what does that mean, knowing God and knowing how he works? First of all, it means that God values you. If, if you know God at all, you know that God values you. In fact, look at your neighbor you're sitting beside right now and, and, and just say to, them, say to them, God values you. Tell them that right now. God values you. A couple of years ago, I was privileged to open, do the opening session at the United Nations in New York. And so I was speaking to all the leaders, the ambassadors of every country and and I wanted to be sure to give them a message that they could, that would really help them with their, with their countries. And, and so I, I did a lesson that was basically entitled, Three Questions Every Follower Ask of a Leader. And I shared with them, regardless of their culture, regardless of, uh, of where they were in the world, I would promise them that the people of their country, every leader within that country, they would be asking their leaders these three questions. And the three questions are simple. Do you care for me? If somebody's going to follow you, they want to know if you care for them. Who wants, to, who wants to follow somebody that doesn't care for them? Can you help me? And in other words, is it going to get better if I follow you? If, if, if I get in the leadership line, is it going to improve my life? Can, can you help me? And thirdly, can I trust you? In every culture, in every society, in every nation, people ask those three questions of their leaders all the time. You love me, can you help me? Can I trust you? And the greatest leader of all, Jesus, can say a resounding yes on all three. He, he, can, he can help you, he loves you, and you can trust him. And when you follow Jesus through the Gospels, the thing that impresses you the most about Jesus is that he valued people. Jesus valued people. Turn the pages of all four Gospels. Everywhere you go, you see that Jesus valued people. The conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees was very simple. They valued knowledge, and he valued people. They valued what they knew about the Scriptures. They were always thinking that life composed of a Bible quiz. And Jesus said, wait a minute, you don't understand. you got to value people. you gotta, you got to see people. And, and, and there are so many examples of Jesus valuing people. But the one I love so much is the one that we know so well, the prodigal son. We know all about him messing his whole life up. He's in a pig pen now. He's asking himself, what's a Jewish boy like me in a pig pen? And he says, I, I, I'm going to go home to my dad. And, and, but he's, he said, if I'm going to go home to my dad, I've got to have a speech prepared because I've certainly messed up my life. And his speech was very simple. He said, I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son. And he practiced it. And I know he practiced it because if you follow the story, it says when he came to his father, he fell down and he immediately said this speech. I mean, he had been practicing all the way, all the way back to the father's house. He was saying to himself, I don't, I, 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 I've, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I, I don't deserve to be called your son. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be your son. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve. He practiced, practiced it. And when he got to the father, he just fell down and he's, he, he gets his speech out. Oh, I, I don't deserve, I don't deserve to be your son. I, I. There were only two people that believed that he didn't deserve to be called 
his father's son, the prodigal that was on his knees in a repentant stage, and the older religious brother who said, you know, I've worked so hard and I've, I, I've done so much for you, Father, and, and, and you're giving a party to, 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 the, to the kid that, that went home. And I have a message for you in 2015. And the message is beautiful about God valuing you, God valuing you online, God, va- God valuing you on every campus. And here's the message, here's the message. You can't disappoint God. You can't disappoint God. Disappointment is the gap between expectation and reality. When we're disappointed, it's because we expected something that we didn't receive. Isn't that true? And we say, wow, I kind of expected that, and wow, I received that, and wow, it wasn't what I kind of thought it would be, and I'm a little bit surprised, I'm I'm a little bit disappointed. That's why the prodigal practiced the speech. I don't deserve to be called your son. He said, give me a bunk in the barnyard. I'll be a servant. You see, get the picture. The boy, the prodigal, was so disappointed in himself that he naturally thought the father would be disappointed in him. And I just want you to know, God's ways are higher than yours. And God's thoughts are higher than yours. And don't dumb God down. Don't dumb him down. Don't bring him down to your level of thinking. And the boy said, I know I'm dis- I just, I, God, the father's going to be disappointed. And the father's not disappointed. In, in fact, the older brother, he can't understand why dad's throwing the party. Can I tell you something? Neither son knew the father. If they would have known the father, they would have known how much he valued his boy. And I just want you to know that To live this year of 2015 in an intentional way. Understand that God values you. And remember this when you think of the older brother. Legalism overvalues works and undervalues people. I've seen it happen throughout my entire life. People that are legalistic, they overvalue what they're doing for God. And they undervalue the people that God so beautifully, unconditionally loves. So to live a life of intentionality, know God and know that he values you and know, secondly, that he will take care of you, that he will take care of you. Every year, Margaret and I give our our family, our children, our grandchildren a a, a gift for Christmas, and the gift is is a trip. We we take them on a trip somewhere every year. year. That's that's our Christmas gift. We, We want to create memories for our kids and grandchildren. So this year we, we went and spent a week, we literally spent up to Christmas Day in, in Hawaii. And, and so we had the grandchildren there. And so Margaret and I said, let's give our grandchildren, we have five, let's give our five grandchildren a verse this year. And, and so we thought about them and talked about them and, and we prayed about it. And, and so we, we picked out a, a verse for each one of our grandchildren, a different verse based on where they are in their life, their temperament, that whole process. And then I, I looked up a quote that was similar to the verse that, that they could have. And then, and then we, we wrote a three to four line prayer for them based on that verse. And we laminated, you have to know, I laminate everything. So you just, excuse me, but I just do. And and, 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 and we lamented with their favorite colors. And we sat with them individually during that week. We sat down individually with them. And we read the scripture. We gave them the quote. We gave them the prayer. And, 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 and the theme that we had for our children this year was the theme of trust. We just want our kids to know that God is a trustworthy God. And I just want you to know you can trust him. You can't trust yourself. You all right out there? Sometimes you can't trust others, but you can trust God. And all of the, all of the verses were just based on, on helping them to understand that this God values them and that they can trust him. When I pastored in San Diego, we had a beautiful African-American pastor named S.M. Lockridge. He's passed away now. Old beautiful preacher i mean he could preach he had an oratory in his voice and his sermons and i mean he preached like i'm going to preach when i go to heaven (laughs) and i would bring him in when you have your beginnings here robert we at the first year i'd bring him in and i'd bring his choir in and and we'd have a night service just like this it was a it was a three-hour service 
It was a three hour because it was a three hour service. The, the choir sang until the glory came and in our church it took a while sometimes. <laughs> and, 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 and then S.M. Lockridge, he preached until the glory came. And, and every year when I'd, I'd call him on the phone and say, now, pastor, I need you to come to get our church ready for the new year. And I, I say, now, I, I, you can preach anything you want to, but, but I want you to take a time out to talk to the people about how they can trust him. Because he had this amazing piece of oratory where he would tell people to trust God. And, and so I, I, I wrote it down, and, and, and I, I can't preach, oh, can't even touch him, can't even preach like him. But I brought it with me, and, and I thought I'd try. And, 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 but you're going to have to help me out. I've got to have an African-American congregation here. You understand? You understand? Okay, you got, you got to, I mean, you got to help me out. You got, to, you got to talk to me, all right? Because there's going to be every once in a while I'm going to say, you can trust him. And when you hear me say, you can trust him, you repeat back to me, we can trust him. We can trust him. You got that? Let's practice it. You can trust him. Oh, okay, okay, you're ready to go. You're ready. Look at, look at the person you're sitting beside and tell them, you just come to church. Go ahead and tell them that. You just come to church right now. In fact, I'll get up. I'm going to do it. I, well, I can't do it like he did it. But this will, be, this will be my pulpit for a moment. All right. This will be my, his, I mean, this man, when we go to heaven, he will be preaching. Paul and he will be preaching. Here's what S.M. Lockridge would say. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperial powerful. He's impartially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of the world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He does not have to call for help, and you can't confuse him. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He stands alone in the solitude of himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem of higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good, and you can call on him. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he sees. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lamber. He forgives the sinner. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He's beautiful. He's meek. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can trust him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway to peace. He's the roadway to righteousness. He's the highway to holiness. He's the gateway to glory. You can trust him, church. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of the governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. I'm telling you, church, you can trust him. Oh, you can trust him. You can trust him. Oh, you can trust him. You can trust him. No one like Jesus. No one like Jesus. Listen to me. Listen to me. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. The word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable because he's incomprehensible. He's irresistible and he He's invincible. I tell you, church, you can trust him. 
You can't get him off your hands. You can't get him off your mind. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Pilate, Pilate couldn't stand him when he found that he couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And thank God, the grave couldn't control him. I'm telling you, church, you can trust him. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. He had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. You can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. I tell you, church, you can trust him. Oh, let's give him a praise. No one like that. No one like Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No one. No one. Thank you, Jesus. No one. No one like Jesus. No one like Jesus. No one like Jesus. Oh, let me pray over you. Father, you are so beautiful. Would we just see you? Everything in our life begins to change. You are a healer. You have forgiven us of our sins. You are God. There is no other. There is no other. Oh, no other at all. Oh, Father, to the carpenter, you're the door. <laughs> to the artist, to the strawberry, you're the bright morning star. <laughs> to the artist, you're that beautiful portrait, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Father, we just worship you right now. We just lay our hearts before you and we say to you as we approach 2015, we're going to live an intentional life and we're going to make our life count. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord <laughs> and we will go in the strength and the might of a God who says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and if God be for me, who can be against me? And so we rest on you. We rely on you. We live for you. We love you. There is no other God. There is no one else we want to walk with. There's no one else we want to talk with. There's no one else we want to live with. There's no one else we want to live for. There is no other God by you. And so we just now raise our hearts and we raise our hands and we proclaim you. King of kings, Lord of lords. And Lord, as we look at 2015, I ask that we would live that intentional life that you can bless, that you can cover, and that we would live that life that would please you. And at the end of the year, may we celebrate one more time your goodness and our faithfulness. Hallelujah. All God's people said, amen. Amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you.